privilege it is for us to be here in the house of the Lord today. We celebrate the end of a quarter, a quarter that has been of great interest, I think, as we've studied the lesson of the great controversy. And it's a day when we will celebrate the communion as instructed by our Lord to follow his example. And whenever we do celebrate the communion, we do so in remembrance of him. So I thought it appropriate this morning in my uh, talk to link up with the lessons that we have studied this quarter. And I found this rather obscure book in the Bible. It's the book of Obadiah. How many of you have read the book of Ob Obadiah? I see a few hands. Not many. Okay. Um, it is the shortest book in the Old Testament. And we don't know who wrote it. And we don't know when they wrote it. There are approximately 12 characters in the Bible called Obadiah. And it is unlikely that any one of them wrote this book. Two possible dates are given for the book, although nobody is sure. The one date is 585 BC, approximately a year after the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. And the second date, 845 BC, when Jerusalem was attacked by the Philistines and the Arabians. And you can find that story in 2 Kings chapter 8. So there's a difference of some 300 years between those two dates, and neither of them uh, can we be certain of. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter who wrote it, and it doesn't matter when it was written. It is a prophetic book. Therefore, its message pertains to the future. And this particular prophecy has eschatological overtones, which means it pertains to the end of time. And as with a lot of prophecy, it has a, an intermediate fulfillment, or a more, uh, re a more immediate fulfillment, but it also has reference to the very end of time. Specifically, the book of Obadiah deals with the a prophecy of judgment on Edom for its betrayal of Israel and its violence against them and its participation in an attack on Jerusalem. And God sees the uh, actions against Israel as particularly serious because Edom and Israel are related. If you look in the book of Deuteronomy, you will find an injunction that the Jews were not to hate the Edomites because it says, he is your brother. How were the Edomites brothers to Israel? Well, the Edomites, if you recall, were the descendants of Esau. And so you are aware, I'm sure, of the hostility that existed between Esau and his brother Jacob. And it seems that this hostility was passed on to successive generations. It's interesting how that tends to happen, how hatred in one generation gets passed on to successive generations. And this ongoing hostility comes to symbolize the hostility between God's people and those who choose not to be his people. And we find this uh, imagery, if you like, this metaphor occurs quite often in the Bible. Right from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, the time of Cain and Abel, we find that people are divided into those who are obedient to God and those who rebel against God. 
And so here we have in the story of Jacob and Esau a similar iconography. We have Esau who rejects God, who rejects the birthright, and we have Jacob who dedicates himself to the service of God. It's important that we remember that Esau despised the birthright, as the Bible puts it. He rejected the birthright. What is the birthright? The birthright was the right to inherit all that belonged to the father. All the material blessings, but also all the spiritual blessings. And it, the Bible tells us that Esau despised the birthright. He turned his back on the birthright for hum, for what? A pot of soup, a pot of stew. Okay? How many in the world today despise our birthright? What is our birthright? Our birthright is Eden and eternity. But we despise our birthright. You see, we are, like Esau, heirs. In Galatians 3.29 we read, And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are heirs. We stand to inherit everything that belongs to the Father. But so many of us despise the birthright. The story of Esau and Jacob is a story of conflict. It is conflict that began in the womb. It's conflict around a pot of stew. It's a conflict that resulted in tricking uh, Esau into giving Jacob the birthright. It is a conflict that resulted in Esau threatening to kill Jacob. It is a conflict that it seems was never resolved. Centuries later, we find the conflict continuing when uh, the children of Jacob are rescued from Egypt by Moses, but Edom refuses to allow them to pass through their land on the way to the promised land. In later years, the Edomites are subdued by King David in warfare. But later, Edom rebelled and regained their independence during the reign of Jehoram. And so we have this picture. We have Esau on the one hand and Jacob on the other. We have the despiser of the birthright and the enemy of Jacob. And we have Jacob, who, yes, was a deceiver himself, but who becomes uh, a changed man, who becomes not Jacob, but Israel, a contender who overcomes. Reminds me, there's a text in the New Testament that talks about God's people as those who overcome. How? By the blood of the Lamb. Conflict. A great history of real conflict and violence. But there's some interesting facts. Did you know that when Jesus was born, Herod the Great tried to have him destroyed. I'm sure you all know that fact, yeah? Did you know that Herod the Great was an Edomite? Yes, he was an Edomite. 
He was a descendant of Esau. Did you know that Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist executed and who played a role in the crucifixion of Jesus, was an Edomite? The conflict continues. From this we can see that Edom represents those who are opposed to God's people and who are opposed to God himself. Edom represents those who, who seek to impede the progress of God's work here on earth. But there is more. If we go back to the book of Obadiah and we look at verses 3 and 4, it says, The pride in your heart has deceived you, talking about Edom. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle, and though you make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Does this passage ring any bells in your thinking? Yeah? What are you thinking? Lucifer. Yes. We have a very similar passage. In Isaiah chapter 14, another one in Ezekiel. But in Isaiah 14 we read, How are you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven. I will raise my, my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Now I hope you see there is a much deeper spiritual, spiritual implication in this passage. You see, Edom becomes a symbol of Satan himself. And this prophecy is not just about the conflict between Esau and Jacob, but it is about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. A conflict that started out in heaven and continued on this earth and will culminate as it says in the book of Obadiah, verse 15, on the day of the Lord. The prophecy has layers of meaning. It is a prophecy of the impending judgment on the Edomites, a judgment that did come to pass. By 312 BC, Edom had ceased to exist destroyed by the very nations with whom she had conspired against Israel. That's interesting. That Edom rallied or, or formed alliances with other pagan nations and tried to destroy the nation of Israel, but in the end those very same allies turned against Edom and Edom was destroyed as indeed will all the nations, all the people who have aligned themselves with Lucifer, all will ultimately be destroyed and will cease to exist. Verse 18 of Obadiah says, There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. And again, verse 16, And they shall be as if they had never been. Those are powerful words. That is a phenomenal prophecy. And just a little plug here for those who believe in an everlasting hell. This judgment leads to total annihilation, not eternal torment. But then following this judgment, 
we read in verse 21 that God sets up his own kingdom. Verse, 12, uh, verse 21 says, And the kingdom will be the Lord's. It's reminiscent of that prophecy in Daniel that at the end of time the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never pass away. Verse 17 of Obadiah 1 we read, But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. This is a common theme in prophecy, the vindication of the righteous. But notice here there's a reference to two mountains. Verse 8 speaks of the mountains of Esau. When Esau moved away from Jacob, he settled around Mount Seir. These are the heights referred to in verse 3. These were, to quote, impregnable heights that caused them to feel invincible. No one could get to them. No one could defeat them. And it was from the security of these mountains that Edom launched its raids against Israel. Mount Seir was a source of violence and hatred. But this is contrasted with God's holy mountain, Mount Zion. In Isaiah 11 verse 9 we read, They will neither hurt nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I want you to notice that the prophecy of, of Obadiah begins with an unusual coupling of God's names. It says there in the opening verses, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now in English we might miss the significance of that. But the word sovereign in Hebrew is Adonai. And the word Lord, in this case, is Yahweh. So we have Lord Yahweh. And that's translated into the English as Sovereign Lord. What is the implication of this? God is the ruler of all. Remember, as Yahweh, He is the Creator God. He is the one who has always been who is unchanging and unchangeable. He is the almighty God, the omniscient God, the all-loving God, the all-wise God, and He is declared to be the sovereign Lord. There is no one else like Him. No one can compare. And this message comes from this person, the Sovereign Lord, Adonai Yahweh. The prophet shows that while man thinks that he controls his destiny, that he plots and he plans his way, that God is working behind the scenes to work out his will on the earth. That it is God that decrees the fate of nations. Put in a nutshell, that God is in control. God uses Edom's own co-conspirators to bring about Edom's final destruction. But another thing that we don't pick up in the English translation of the prophecy of Obadiah is the tense that he uses. He uses a prophetic perfect tense. In other words, it is written as if it has already happened. The prophecy, although it pertains to the future, it is written in language that seems to indicate that it has already happened. And that is because when God says something, when God promises something, when God prophesies something, it will come 
to pass. Without doubt, it will come to pass. It emphasizes the certainty of the prophecy. And this is a common theme with many of the prophets, that what the Lord says comes to pass. No question and no deviation. There is in this a sense of certainty. And for us who live in a very uncertain world, this should be a source of great comfort. That as we see the wheeling and the dealing, as we see the crime and the corruption, as we see the violence and the destruction all around us, that we know that there is a God and he is working out his plan of salvation and that there will be an end to it just as there was an end to Edom. So there will eventually be an end to all of those who set themselves up against God, even Satan himself, because ultimately all will be called to account. And then the prophecy ends. It says in verse 20, and then God's people possess the land. Or as Jesus put it in the Sermon on the Mount, the meek shall inherit the earth. And the meek are those who wait on the Lord, knowing that he is the sovereign Lord and that he is in control. May these thoughts bless you and strengthen you and encourage you. Amen.